Hello world, I have a confession to make. When I first read about the Kotlin reified operator, my intrusive thoughts started making an appearance. I started thinking, I should make every generics method reified. I mean, sounds like a lot of fun, getting free information at runtime that I would otherwise not have. And yes, I realized the extra overhead due to the inline operator. But then I wondered, why is it needed in the first place? The process behind the loss of information on the generic type during runtime is called erasure. Erasure isn't just a Java thing, and it's not just about generics. It's actually a super common technique used in programming to translate high-level code into lower-level code, like when, for instance, Java source code gets compiled into bytecode, or when C code turns into machine code. Why does this happen? Well. As we move down from high-level languages to things like bytecode, assembly, or even hardware instructions, the type system gets simpler. And that is by design. You wouldn't want your computer's processor to understand every Java feature, right? Imagine trying to bake Java's virtual method calls directly into an Intel CPU. It wouldn't make sense. Instead, erasure is what helps bridge that gap. It takes complex types and simplifies them mapping them to something the lower level can understand. Of course, while making sure everything was correctly type-checked beforehand. This process happens all the time in, comp in compilers across different languages. For example, let's take Java bytecode, the set of instructions that the JVM actually runs. There are no special instructions for types like bytes or booleans. Instead, Java erases these smaller types and treats them as integers behind the scenes. So when you work with a byte or a boolean in Java, the compiler actually maps them to integer operations. Why? Because having fewer, more general instructions makes the JVM simpler and more efficient. Many of Java's high-level features, like checked exceptions, method overloading, enums, lambdas, they exist only at the source code level. The compiler checks them, but they don't exist in the final bytecode. This makes sense. They're just languages com language conveniences and they get erased during compilation. This is why this process is called erasure. And of course, this happens in other languages as well. When C compiles to native machine code, it doesn't differentiate between signed and unsigned integers. They're just stored in general purpose CPU registers. The takeaway, erasure is everywhere. It's a key technique that helps high-level languages work efficiently on lower level systems without unnecessary complexity. So now the next topic is how do programming languages actually handle generics under the hood? Well, there are two main strategies. First is the homogeneous translation. This means that a generic class like foo of t is compiled into, into a single artifact like foo.class in Java. And second is the heterogeneous translation. This means that each specific type instantiation gets compiled separately. So foo of string and foo of integer are entirely different types with their own compiled versions. C++ uses heterogeneous translation. Its template instantiation is fully expanded into its own version. So vector of int and vector of float are totally separate entities. On the one hand, this is great for type safety and for the quality of generated code as it can be optimized. On the other hand, this means larger code fo footprint. Since vector of int and vector of float, they have separate code and we cannot talk about vector of something like we can in Java using wildcards. And fun fact, Scala experimented with a specialized annotation that when applied to type variables, it caused the compiler to emit specialized versions for all the primitive types. And while this sounds cool, it results in an explosion of generated classes, so one can easily generate a very huge jar file just from a few lines of code. This decision, this choice between the type of translation is yet another design decision like so many others. We have to understand the pros and cons of each version deeply, then make an educated choice depending on our interests. I believe it's clear by now that Java opted to go for the homogeneous translations. We check the generics during compile time, but at the generated bytecode level, we only have the single class file. A list of strings simply becomes a list, 
whereas any bounded type, like a list of star which ex extends object, will be erased to its upper bound. In this case, it will be a list of object. At the use site, all reference to list of string are erased to list. But why? Java Generics adoption had a very specific requirement. It must be possible to evolve an existing non-generic class to be generic in a binary compatible and source compatible manner. Are you curious to see how ArrayList used to look like before Java 1.5, before generics? Well, here it is. Um, yep, a lot of casting involved. So the objective was that when generics were introduced, ArrayList could continue to recompile without a change against the generified ArrayList of T. And that existing class files would continue to link to the methods of, of the generified array list of T. Java is built on the concept of separate compilation but dynamic linking. This means that we can drop a new jar file inside our project and it will work without us needing to recompile everything. The linking happens dynamically on the already compiled files. And it's one of the strengths of Java. At the time of generics, there was so much Java in the world that by breaking this compatibility, Java's value would drop instantly. And there is another reason for this choice, and that is the JVM ecosystem. Java is not a single organism. We sometimes tend to forget that, but it's actually an ecosystem. It's the Java languages and the JVM, and they both have separate specifications. The Java compiler produces class files that are compatible with the JVM specification. Actually, the JVM will run any class file that adapts to a specification. It doesn't know or care if it was written in Java. There are many, many languages that compile for the JVM, and Kotlin is one of them. JVM is quite abstract in specification, allowing for flexibility, and, that is why, and that's why there are so many languages targeting the JVM. To add generic support for the JVM, there would be a technical investment with very high effort plus the coordination across all the implementers. If we, all, if we add all those arguments together, we realize Erasure was the pragmatic choice. I hope this shed some light into the decision-making of Erasure and how the pragmatic choice usually is not fancy, but it is a compromise that can contain a lot of difficult decisions for the greater good. Until next time, I'm Konstantinos. Thank you very much for watching.